so um, my name is Rich Gange. Um, most of you probably know me from uh, a training I did on site or maybe a workshop or something like that, or maybe you know me through support, um, one of those different avenues. Um, last year, I did a talk on custom workflows uh, with Steve McDermott from VSP. And I was looking back on it, and I was thinking it was a little technical heavy. Um, so I tried to um, change that this time around, just um, create a presentation that everybody can get something out of. So, um, um, so hopefully at the end of the, of the talk, you should be able to talk search configuration at a, at a high level with developers. Um, so this is primarily a talk on search. Um, search is usually a part of every single project. I don't see it often not. Um, but what I do see a lot is that uh, clients don't think about search until the end. Uh, when they see maybe it's not performing the way they thought it would or the way they expected it to. Um, and really, a savvy developer could be thinking about it during, um, during template design. Because when you design dialogues or um, detail sub apps, for example, you use fields. And um, those fields determine how the content is stored. Okay? So the name of the field ends up being the name of the property that holds the content, for example. So um, thinking about it ahead of time can really save you some heartache uh, in, in the end. Um, for example, also if your site is a uh, multi-language site, single site multi-language, uh, that's going to affect the way content stored. You'll have a content stored with a two-character um, code for the language. Um, but yeah, this is just primarily talk on search. And Lucene and, and Solar are just tools that we use to perform search. Okay. So who uses search? Well, according to a study done by Search Engine Watch in uh, 2011, they concluded that 90% of internet users search. And um, when you looked at the demographics, whether it was race, class, gender, education level, it really didn't matter. It was 90% across the board. So what that tells you is that everybody understands that you can use search to find what you want um, on the internet or on your computer or maybe on the web page that you're looking at, whatever that search might be doing. Um, also, they concluded that 60% search regularly. So people use search, and people understand that it's there for them. And uh, when they want to find something, they can use it. Um, but this, this particular um, uh, survey was more about SEO. And this is not a talk on SEO. But uh, it, did, it did say that it really helped us conclude that, that search is fundamental. And you know, at any time, you might have your web page open, and there might be four or five different search boxes. You know, one to search the web, one to search the page, one to search the application, um, maybe one to search the website. So there's a lot of different types of search. And, and people use it. Um, so how do they find content? You want, you, want, you want to find out what is the experience like on your website. Uh, so that way you can provide a robust search function to help users find the content they're looking for. Some people might say that nobody uses uh, my site search anyway, so why should I worry about it? Um, we spend a lot of money on UI design, sometimes people will say. And, and you know, we have this really fancy mega menu, and that's how people find what they're looking for. Um, but uh, what will end up happening is they'll put search at, at very low importance and, and, and conclude that people use it as a last resort. And I mean, that might be true for some websites, I would guess, but not, but not all. Uh, what you really want to do is if people aren't using the search feature, you might want to just think about why that is. Uh, maybe the search isn't finding what they're looking for. Maybe it's not working the way that it should. 
Uh, another thing that sometimes happens is the, the color scheme could make the search box kind of disappear into a website, or um, maybe there's something else on the website that's drawing attention. So for example, here's a site that I use quite a bit, Amazon.com. And pretty much every time I come to Amazon.com, I start with a search. I don't ever usually go to the departments and try to find my way through there. I find that search on Amazon.com um, is the way to find what I'm looking for quickly. And notice the way they have it designed, too. You, it it kind of stands out, the search box. It's, it's the primary. It's, it's right up there top. You can't really miss it. It's, it's really there. It's, it's almost guiding you to it, saying, hey, this is what you would use to, to find what you're looking for on our website. Well, let's compare that to another site that I like to shop at a lot, IKEA. Uh, you look at an IKEA site, you can see there's a search box up there. It's kind of uh, washed out a little bit because of the screen. But there is one up there. You can see the search button. But what's really drawing your attention here is the, um, the menu. It's blue. It's bright. It's, you see it right away. But even though you might not be using search verbatim, probably those menus are using a search query in the background. So search is still important, even if you have a UI design that's not necessarily um, that's, that's overpowering your search function. All right. So I got to keep my nose here. I'm make sure I uh, don't miss anything. All right. So I learned last year that every good talk should have a quote. Um, that was from uh, Atlassian. Thank you guys for that. Um, and uh, this is from Ethan Zuckerman. He's from MIT. He said, um, in a world where everyone creates content, uh, it gets confusing pretty quickly without a good search engine. And I like this one because I felt like it was relevant to my talk. And it has a kind of a Ferris Bueller type of feel to it as well. <laughs> Um, so let's get into it then. So Lucene. Lucene is uh, a tool that we use to perform search. And in simple terms, Lucene is a Java-based indexing and search technology. Um, Lucene is used by Jackrabbit to index the workspaces. So each uh, workspace in Magnolia has its own index that's indexed by Lucene. And um, the version uh, of Lucene that Jackrabbit 2.8 uses is as Lucene 3.6, which was released in 2012, so you know four years ago. So it's a it's a little bit old, and there's several releases out there since then. So Jackrabbit's a little bit behind the times on as far as what um, version of Lucene it uses, um, and it also Jackrabbit only brings in the core module of Lucene, and uh, if you were to look. Okay. How do I get out of this now? I forgot how to get escape. Yeah, there we go. Uh, let me show you quickly. I wanted to come over here. And uh, so there's the core module of Lucene, but look at all these other modules that are there. There's a lot that Lucene, it's a very powerful library of stuff there. Um, some of this I'll talk about in a little bit, like the analyzers, for example. There's lots of different analyzers for analyzing different types of content. And um, you might find that useful. In, in your project. So let me back up here. All right. OK. All right. So let's talk about, real quickly, I just want to give you a crash course. Let me put this back to play. All right. I want to give you a little crash course here on how uh, Lucene performs an index. OK? So for example, I, um, I have two documents, document 0, document 1. Um, each of those documents has what's called a field one single field that has a fact about Magnolia and Lucene. Um, Lucene is used to index content in Magnolia, and each workspace in Magnolia has a search index. OK, so two documents, one field each, a fact about Magnolia. When Lucene indexes those documents, that index might end up looking something like this. OK, so there'll be use, essentially there's this table uh, where it will extract all the words from these two uh, documents. and then wherever they appear, in the do if they appear in document 0, then it will, will mark it there. And if it appears in document 1, then it will also indicate that as well. Some, in some cases, the term appears in both documents. In some cases, the term only appears in one of the documents. And you'll notice that some of the, um, some of the terms are left out, is, to, in those are called stop words. Um, there's a, a library of stop words that Lucene is just going to filter out for you already. So, but essentially, 
what you'd have is something that looks like this, though, for if we were going to index these two documents. And what this is called is an inverted index example. So we have some terminology here now. We have document, we have um, field, and we have term. Okay, so the documents has fields, the fields have terms. Okay? So some Lucene features. So with Lucene, you can search and sort on any field in the document. Uh, so your index document will, will usually be made up of a, of a bunch of fields, not just one field, but more than one field. Um, Lucene will allow you to simultaneously update and search at the same time. And as soon as the data is persisted, you should be able to search it right away. Um, you can also search multiple indexes with Lucene. And you can do this with uh, many powerful query types, uh, such as a phrase query, um, just you know, like a string of text, like New York City or something like that. Uh, you can use a wildcard query. I think everybody might know what that is. Uh, there's a proximity query. Basically, I want a query looking for two terms that are in a certain distance of each other. You can do those kind of things. And there's also a range query. A range query retrieves all the records between two different types of values. Um, they also have ranked searching as well. So this is vital to customer experience, I think. You want to make sure that the most relevant is showing up first. So this, this kind of speaks to making sure that you have a robust search feature on your website. Because um, it, it's essentially the foundation of the search. All right. And we have an assortment of analyzers. And analyzers um, control how the content is indexed. So we have different, because not all content is the same, so we want to index it differently. And, and Lucene provides a way to do that. Um, faceted indexing and search capabilities. So basically, um, Lucene is going to allow me to apply a filter or multiple filters to a search. Uh, you also have keyword highlighting is possible using Lucene. Geospatial search, when we're combining location data with uh, regular data, I guess you could say, regular data, um, uh, text data. Auto-suggest and spell check support are also available in Lucene. So you would think with all these great features, I could just stop the presentation here and we can all go home, right? What's the problem here? What's the problem if, for most developers now, if they want to write a powerful search function using Lucene? Does anybody know what that, that fundamental problem was? It's this guy, Java. You have to know Java in order to do it. So that usually is a roadblock for a lot of people, especially with, um, you know, this whole transitioning to um, front-end devs, the so-called front-end dev. So what we need is a way for everybody to be able to provide and search um, the index. All right, so enter solar. What is solar? Well, solar is basically, in simple terms, a web application built on top of Lucene. And um, when you use solar, it brings in the entire Lucene suite. So you have all, the, all those modules that I was pointing to before, those are all part of Solar by default. So with Solar, you can do everything that Lucene can do because it builds off of it. In some cases, it might override some functionality or add some new functionality, but essentially you can do everything uh, in the two technologies. But the biggest benefit is you can search using a REST API. So now we don't have to know Java anymore. Solar to the rescue, save us from that. It also provides us a nice administrative web app. So let me take a look at that real quick. So let's just give you a show of what that has. All right, so Solar, again, it's a web application on its own. So right here we have the dashboard. You get a, you get an, a feel for um, the, the system statistics. You have some information about what version of Lucene we're using. Uh, you have some logging information in here. Uh, the cores, you can look at the cores. I'll talk about those in a second. Java properties. Um, you can also, a core is essentially your index. And in here you can analyze that, that core and look at it. You can perform queries on it. There's all kinds of stuff in here. I haven't used a lot of it yet, but um, it looks pretty powerful. Um, you can monitor server statistics using a uh, technology called JMX. 
Uh, basically, it's a Java technology for, um, for managing applications. And then another great feature that Solar allows you to do is index replication. So I can easy, uh, quickly and easily create another, um, a same index using a built-in functionality. And that will come into play later in the talk. So how does Solar work? If you go to Solar's website, they'll describe it like this. They'll say, well, think of Solar as a loose leaf book of recipes, okay? And um, what we're gonna do is every time we add a recipe, we are going to index that recipe by its ingredients only. So that way we can find, uh, if we have some ingredient we wanna use, we can find all the recipes that use that ingredient. Okay, great. Um, so essentially we're gonna create an index around just in the ingredients. But typically you'd probably wanna create um, other fields too, like the name of the recipe, for example, maybe a category of the recipe, different things like that. So what you would have is something that looks like this, a solar document. So here I've created a recipe, uh, I've uh, indexed a recipe, this is uh, Rachel's Thanksgiving trifle. If you're a Friends fan, you might know what this is. Uh, lady fingers, jam, custard, raspberries, beef, peas, onions, bananas, whipped cream, salt, pepper. Made in 25 minutes. It's a dessert, question mark maybe, uh, an English style dessert. And um, basically this is how Solar sees the world as documents. Everything can be broken down and reduced into a, a document. Um, so like for example, if Solar was going to index a person, you know, it might have height, weight, hair color, things like that. So basically, Solar would see you as a, as a document. But um, if we add more recipes, if we keep adding recipes to Solar, over time, we're able to ask questions like, how many English-style desserts that have beef as an ingredient can be prepared in fewer than 30 minutes? And then we would find this document. OK, so we can ask it questions now. So, Okay, we, have, we saw how to index a recipe. Let's now apply this to Magnolia. Um, so in Magnolia, what we would probably want to do is uh, index pages, all right? So basically, a page is, equivalent to gonna, is gonna be equivalent to a document here. So we identify the parts of the page that we would like to index. We don't have to index everything. We just, we just point to, okay, let's index this title here, uh, this headline, and this text here. And then the, uh, the document might end up looking something like that, for example. Okay, so I have an ID for the document, I have a title, I have a headline, and I have some text. So in the end, we'll, we'll have a collection of index documents or pages that we can now search. So, at a high level, Solar will look something like this. You have the Solar web application, and, in, and the web application will be managing as many cores as you need. It can manage multiple cores at one time. But um, Magnolia is only set up to work with, uh, with one core. Okay, so you'll have, uh, you might have a Solar with more indexes, but only one of them will point to a Magnolia instance. Um, you could have maybe multiple publics or something like that. That would work as well. Um, so, you could have one solar instance for every public. That will work just fine because you can have multiple cores. Or you could have something like this. You could have uh, a, a separate solar instance for each public. Either way, it's gonna work just fine. It's up to you. Um, let me step back for one sec here. Okay. So we have what's called a, a schema.xml. And basically what this guy does is it describes how we index the documents uh, and what fields are going to be available. So there's, the schema.xml just basically tells Solar how to index uh, Magnolia. For auto scaling, you can use the index replication. So if you wanted to take Solar to production and you were going to have some, um, you're gonna have Magnolia instances coming up and down based on demand, you could use that index replication and that will make it so that Solar can scale as well very nicely too. So it's not gonna, it's not gonna stop you from that. So what do we offer? So the Magnolia Solar module, it's compatible with Solar 5. Uh, Solar 6 was just released like a couple of months ago, so we're not quite there yet, but we are compatible with Solar 5. 
Uh, this will also bring in leucine 5. Okay, so now we're able to, we're able to upgrade leucine without having to impact jackrabbit. So I don't think we could just upgrade uh, leucine and jackrabbit and not have that work okay. But um, here we can, we don't have to worry about it at all because they're separate entities from each other. Uh, we can index any workspace by creating an index configuration, which I'll show you in a second. So once we have it all set up, we'll index Magnolia workspaces, or we could crawl any internal or external site. There's another way you could index your uh, website as well. Um, you can also do field boosting and query filtering. So uh, query filtering, we can, we can filter the query to target to certain fields. So for example, in a single site multi-language website, let's say I only want to search the fields that are, that are relevant to the language that the, um, the user is viewing the site in. Uh, a common problem right now, you might even notice this with uh, the travel demo, is if you're on the German site and you search an English word, then it will find those English words because the, soul, the index is one big glob. And I'll show you that in a second. So what you can do is what's called a localized search. So solar, having solar makes it very easily so that you can just create a nice localized search. And it's a very common use case. I, I know this because at the Light Development Workshop, especially in the European stops, this was a, a, a very popular topic and asked at every single one. Uh, how do I separate this so I don't get English content in my German search and vice versa? So the way it works is we use what's called a language filter. So we're just still going to query everything, and then we're going to filter it after the fact. Sometimes this can be more efficient than, than trying to use some sort of complicated join or where clause or something like that. Um, so then what we'll have is uh, we'll, have, we'll provide the results in one language, so we won't have that problem anymore. OK, so let's take a look at this, how this works. All right, escape. So first, let me just. If you haven't seen this issue before, uh, I, have a, uh, I have a Magnolia set up here um, on my local host. This is just a plain old 456. Right now I'm looking at the German site. And um, sometimes, you know, English words do appear in German content. But you only want to find those English words if they appear in the German content, not if they appear in the English content as well. So if I search the word unique, for example, OK, here we go. It's already there. Oh. In a while. Let me try again. Here. All right, so I do find two results, but you see I have a mix and a match of, of English content here and German content. And this is what we want to avoid. It's found two documents. Yes, it, there are two documents, but that, that, that term is appearing in the English content, not the German content. And I'm on the German version of the site. All right, so that's the issue that we have. So how do we solve this problem? The first step is to, okay. The first step is to install the solar module. All right, hold on here. All right. And then you have an indexer configuration here. There's a couple of modules involved. So there's the, uh, the content indexer. And what I'm going to do is I created um, two website indexes. Uh, the, one, the first one up there is just going to be for the default language, which is English in this case. And then I created another one with the underscore a DE at the end for my German. And what I do here is I identify the fields that I want Solar to index for, um, or to filter for this particular uh, index. So and then I give it a name, a type, a website. I do the same thing for German. So you can see the difference here. All I've done is take abstract, and then I, it becomes abstract DE. Because this is how the properties get stored um, in the website workspace. If you've ever looked back there, you'll see these underscore DE or underscore whatever the two letter abbreviation is for that language. And then again, I give it a type. So that one we called website up there, and this one will be called website DE. So basically what happens is, is I will filter um, only on the, the German fields and the English fields. Um, then what I will do, the, um, 
I have a solar-based travel demo search result template. Okay, so let's take a look at that. And what I did is I came into the travel demo, and all I did, it was pretty simple. Oops, sorry, down here. Is I took the original one that the travel demo provided me, and I just duplicated it, and I created the solar search result page instead of a search result page. And all I did between the two is if I look at this one here, I just replaced um, this component with one that's provided by the solar module. It's here. All right, so that's all that was really done there. So I just copied and changed one component, and now I'm ready to go. Um, then from that, what I have to do now is I have to create a landing page for each language. Okay? So I come into pages, and I went to the same spot that uh, the travel demo created its search result page. All right, and I created two more search result pages, one for EN, one for DE, English results, German results, using the travel solar search result template. Then what I did is I came up here to the home page, and this is where you configure where the search result page is located. And I internationalized that field. So now if I have, uh, if it's English, then I will land on the English search page. If it's German, I will land on the German search page. Okay, so now let's see it work. All right, so you already see here, I've done the search already once, and okay, ho-hum, it returned the same thing. So I, I'm in the English site, and I searched the word unique, and it found two results for me, which I expect. Now if I switch to the German site, and remember before, the issue was if I searched unique, now it's not finding it anymore, and now I'm doing what's called the localized search. Okay, so it really wasn't too hard. I mean, it was, uh, it was basically taking some, some templates I already had available to me. I changed a couple of things, created a couple of pages, and I was ready to go. All right. So that's, uh, that's one of the um, most common use cases I found uh, recently uh, that people have been asking for, and solar solves that nicely. Um, but we can take this a step further, actually. So let me just step back a bit here. All right. All right. Because, like I mentioned, all content is not created equal. Um, depending on the types of fields used in your dialogues or your detailed sub-apps, Content might be saved differently. So you might have plain text, you might have HTML, you might have uh, UUIDs for links, uh, different languages, etc. So why would you index it all the same? So let's start by taking a look at the default configuration for, um, for indexing uh, that Magnolia provides to you. And, and what it does is it basically just says, we're going to index all the nodes except the metadata. We're going to boost the title. And what we're also going to do is we're going to aggregate the page and all its sub areas and sub components into one document. And if there's sometimes you can have areas that are inside areas, so we'll do the uh, recursive as well. But we haven't targeted any of the fields. So but what this is essentially saying to, to the system is every field just index it the same way. Even if it's German content or it's English content, if it's HTML, if it's plain text, just index it the same way. And that's not really a great thing. What we really want to do is, is look at this thing word by word. Um, so to solve this issue, we have to first understand what analyzers, tokenizers, and filters are. So analyzers examine the text of the fields and generates a token stream. Okay, so we're looking at the fields, that's where the content is. The analyzer is going to start looking at those fields, get a token stream. The tokenizer breaks that field data into le lexical units or tokens. Um, so based on how you're tokenizing it, maybe on white space, every white space creates a token, for example. Then the filters 
can look at the tokens created by the tokenizers and transform them, discard them, or create new ones. So, analyzers. Use when a document is indexed at, and at query time. Okay? And um, it may be a single class or it may be composed of a series of tokenizers or filter classes. So what this means is basically what an analyzer is, is this kind of like um, parent container class that you can have as many tokenizers or filters um, used with inside of it. You string them together as you need them. So maybe you want to filter on uh, HTML characters, and then you want to filter on something else, and then tokenize it two different ways. You can do all these things. Once you create your custom analyzer, you configure it on a field. So for example, I'll create an analyzer for, say, fields that might store HTML content. And what I want to do is filter out all that HTML so it doesn't become part of the index. Another common use case that I've seen in support recently. Um, some different types of analyzers that Lucene provides out of the box is the, the white space, the keyword, and the stop word. Uh, those are all in there. Then there's a full set of language analyzers. So if you wanted to take your localized search one more step, let me show you over here. In this analyzers common, if you come here, we, you'll find there's an analyzer for almost every language out there. So you could, you could essentially target your German content with a German analyzer. And then that would be, it would be analyzed more appropriately using proper stimming and stuff like that. So there's, a, there's an, basically an analyzer for every language in there. There's a whole bunch of other analyzers as well. But these are, I think, really important when it comes to the localization topic. So you could actually take that, that localization thing one step further and even analyze your text better. All right. Tokenizers, they break up the stream of characters. So tokenizers, basically all they do is they read the character stream and produce a sequence of token objects. They'll just read the characters one by one and it will look for certain delimiters, whatever the delimiter might be in this case. Most of the time it's white space, okay? So every time you see a white space, that's gonna create a token. Analyzers use tokenizers to read the character stream. So, Basically, when, when it, what this means is the analyzer is aware of the field it's configured for, but the tokenizer is not. Because remember, the analyzer is this parent container, and it uses the tokenizer. Filters, like tokenizers, they consume input and produce a stream of tokens. Unlike tokenizers, the filter's input is another token stream. So basically, what the filter will do is just look at each token and decide what to do with it. Should I pass it along, replace it, discard it? change it somehow, whatever I want to do to it. So let's look at a use case of all this. Let's put this all together then. So let's say I have a dialogue that looks like this, okay? Uh, or excuse me, a field in a dialogue that looks like this. And it says, here I have some text using a rich text editor field, okay? So look at how the content is then stored. It's a little blurry, but you can see right here, strong is right butted up against this word rich. So what would happen here is this would become a single token, okay? And this over here would become a token. And that's really not what we want. I, I really want to just index this. And I really want to just index that. I want this to go away. This is how the, the system works um, by default. So what I do, putting this all together then, is I create my own analyzer. And I'm going to call it the HTML strip character analyzer, all right? Then I'm going to use a white space tokenizer. So I'm going to tokenize the stream and into white spaces. But then I'm going to send it through an HTML strip character filter. And that's essentially going to pull off all those HTML um, pieces that were on there before. So now I'll index the word here. I'll index the word rich and not the concatenation of that with some HTML element. Okay. So, and then finally what I will do is once I have the strip character analyzer, let's go back. Remember that default configuration that I showed you? What I'll do is I'll add a line into it. So, God, it's really small, isn't it? Let me go. Ah. Hold on, stand by. All right. Where are you, Adam? So 
So I, this is just basically that same default configuration. I took it, it's in the core module, I took it out of the core module, and then I added an analyzer configuration. And I'm saying whenever you see a property called text, then apply the strip character analyzer to it. So now that field, any kind of fields that were, um, that were storing HTML uh, with that property name will be stripped out. So this goes back to what I was saying. If the savvy developer would think about the names of their fields ahead of time, um, because I believe you can use wildcards here. So if I was going to have a field that's storing HTML, it might be advantageous to call it text HTML or something in there with HTML to indicate it has HTML. So that way I could say any fields that have that sequence of characters, go ahead and apply that analyzer to it. So that would make it, that would make it easier than having a bunch of configurations for each field. I could essentially grab them all at one time. Just one way to go. All right. Flipping back and forth here, all right. Improving performance. So maybe the, the last thing that you might want to think about, um, you know, after you've applied all your filters and your analyzers to all your fields, uh, maybe performance isn't so great. Um, so there's a, a page in uh, Lucene's documentation that has a lot of uh, things to try if, um, maybe your search performance isn't so great. Um, these are just a few that I picked out. First, find the real issue. It could be a hardware issue, it could be a software issue. So you need to determine that first, and they give some tips for doing that as well. Avoid complex query analysis or heavy post-processing. That can cause bottlenecks. And like I mentioned before, you should, you should Consider maybe also just a filter rather than a query clause. So just grab all the data and then filter it, or try the query, um, the complex query. See which one performs better. You have a couple of choices there. Of course, faster hardware is never going to hurt. And um, also, you might want to think about can the index? Uh, Lucene will take the entire index and try to put it into memory. So if, um, if you don't have enough available RAM, you could start paging at that point. So that could, perform, that could affect the, uh, the search uh, index performance. And again, down here I have a source to some other uh, techniques to improve your search and make it faster. And of course, happy searching, as Solar would say. So that's the end. Any questions about um, search, Lucene, Solar? Yes. So what you have, so there's an indexing configuration. Let me get, I keep forgetting how to get out of here. All right. So back over here, I was looking at, let me close these up. So down here you have crawlers. And here you see a, you see a couple examples. Here we're gonna crawl the corporate site and the bbc.com, so it's just a configuration, and then the same, so you have the same field mappings. You have to tell Solar what to index, but then you just simply point it to the, um, the website that you want to index, give it the fields, um, and then you can schedule this, or you can do it on demand manually if you'd like. It's possible to do. So then that way you could, Maybe you have like a site in Magnolia, but you also have maybe there's some old corporate site that's still up and you want to have, a, have an index that combines all of that. So when people search on the main website, they get pages that could be appearing on that other site. You can do that with this crawler. So that's stored, that's stored then? If, it, if you create a task, then it would be stored every so often? Yes, exactly. You could say index it every day or something like that, yeah. Or you can always come in and do it on demand. So if you want to come in and do it on demand, it's just simply right here you have a property called indexed. And if you change this to false, nope, false. And then you just wait a couple of seconds. You got to give it some time to, um, to search. And eventually here I'll see a message pop up. There it is. So successful indexing, 36 page was successfully indexed in one second. So that's the manual. 
But um, we do also have a configuration for um, indexing on publication or indexing on a scheduled job. Sorry, I apologize if you already went over this, but is there a way to, when you issue your search query, to tell uh, Solar which core to use or to use all of them? No, the way Magnolia, the way our module is designed, so up here, uh, the solar search provider, the configuration, it's only allowed, it's only um, set up to work with one core. But solar can manage multiple cores, so you could have one solar instance manage every core for every Magnolia instance, like I mentioned, uh, or you could have multiple solar instances. You know, it's just a matter of, you know, if that one solar instance goes down, then your search is down for every site. So uh, that could be a problem. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, One, uh, I've noticed, like in the last couple of years, that people, uh, websites in general, have been appreciating searches, uh, and they are really crappy, and that in fact it, they're hard to find. Uh, so they stop. <laughs> they stop actually putting a label on it. So if you do a Control F uh, and look for search, uh, it will it will be invisible to you. Um, even if it finds the word, um, because it's like it will really shadow a uh, description within the field, but uh -huh. not an actual tag. That's just like a key comment that I Okay. Really All right. Um, but uh, question one is uh, what do you think are, what do you think is like the low hanging fruit or like, you know, the worst thing that searches uh, do on, on sites? Because they really are pretty awful. Um, and the second thing is, um, do, does Lucene have some type of uh, learning uh, module where it can improve searches uh, over time as people like, you know, query for certain things and find pages? Um, I believe it has a caching mechanism, but I don't know if it's, it has any kind of um, intelligence over time that I'm aware of. Um, no, I don't know on that, the answer to that question, to be honest with you. Um, the, as far as uh, the worst thing about search, I think, was just treating everything like it's the same. You know, just all, all the content's the same and we're just going to index it all the same way because these analyzers have things called uh, stemmers built in. So instead of uh, indexing, um, uh, I don't know, testing and test, uh, we might just stem that to test and we'll find both of those, right? So. That's another thing that it can do. And then that way your index becomes smaller. So that's kind of a nice thing to do. Rather than having to bloat your index with all these variations of basically the same word. So in terms of Magnolia, the, it would be uh, specify a couple of fields that you want uh, indexed. Don't take the defaults of everything. Yes. You could, especially like, for example, the rich text editor, which is so popular. And uh, what happens with the rich text editor is Magnolia is, okay, it's gonna, it's gonna index any HTML in there by default, like, like we saw. And uh, then when you get the search, uh, what it will do is when, it, when we run, perform a search, it will grab a little snippet of where it found that. And then you'll end up having some HTML in there. And then those tags might not be closed. And then it might throw off the rest of your, your web page. So it's a really nasty little problem that, that ends up happening. But you know, I, I, like I'm, I usually tell people on support is, is once you cross that, that content template border, you know, and you start putting HTML markup in your content, well, there's just, that's just gonna happen. You know, if you keep the clean separation, you're not gonna have to worry about that. But I understand that, you know, the HTML, um, the HTML field that we have, the rich text editor, they're so popular. I mean, I've seen implementations where it's just one component, the rich text editor, and they're creating the whole website like that. So then you have all this HTML in your content and it messes up the index and bloats the index. Um, maybe I missed something. How did, how did the ranking part of that work? The ranking? So you could actually, let me go to the uh, solar documentation here. You can, down here, where is it? Uh, right here. So we can boost. And we can say, um, if, I, um, if I'm searching a document and uh, the term appears in the title, 
So I have two documents, and one of the documents the term appears in the title, and in the other document the term appears somewhere else. I want to give more relevance to the title. And you can do this very easily by using this, uh, here's an example that Milan has given. And where you do this at is you can go to, remember the search results are pages that I created. Let me open those up, open up one of them. So inside here, there is of course a properties dialog. And here you see I've applied the filter that I mentioned before, the type website, but you can also put the boost in there as well too. The boost can also be configured in the schema XML that I mentioned, and it can also be configured in the default indexing configuration for Lucene. It's like we do, we created, the, we put the title in. Um, so that's like a collection of keywords that you want to Yes, yes, okay. exactly. So I could basically come over here and just grab this little guy and boost the query, just like that. So yeah, give more relevance to, or less relevance. I imagine you could probably do like custom fields and if you had, like maybe you had a product and the name changed, but then you still want that old yeah. name to still activate yeah. the search. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I'd have to look, I'd have to think about that one. Um, yeah, it's a good point. Um, the thing is about it is, you know, I just been working on this thing for about a month, and uh, when I started, you know, looking at what Lucene had and what Solar had, there's so much in there. And then you look at what Magnolia is using; it's just using the core of Lucene. So there's a lot of stuff still there. You can get really granular with how you index all of your content. I mean, you could really, if you're if you're really, you know. Uh, concerned about search performance, it can, it can get as granular as you need it to be. Yes? So I'm going to piggyback on the question that we asked that how can we really improve the quality of searches on our site? So we spoke about that maybe there is something that can improve the search intelligence by learning patterns. I think another thing that uh, plays a critical role is a feedback loop, right? How many terms are being searched which are not including any results? Yes. Well, yeah, so the, the Solar uh, and Lucene have, I think they both have it, the suggestion. So it'll start suggesting based on what it has in the index can also help that search as well. So just trying to understand the feedback loop a little more, like does, is there a provision we can do some kind of logging where you know some data is getting written that users query for these terms, it did not feed any results, and maybe somebody should go and author that content. So you're getting the picture, right? Like a feedback loop. Yeah. I mean I guess you could build that into maybe when somewhere in the search uh, the model class that performs the search or something like that, you could start grabbing some statistics there. Um, for example, the model class I believe used by Solar is called a faceted, uh, oh boy, faceted search result model class. So maybe somewhere in here, when it actually does the searching, so whatever the method that is, you could add something there. Maybe even a workspace and keep some data in that workspace about how the searches are being performed or write it to a database or something. Um, but off the top of my head, I don't know. I haven't thought about that. It's a good question. All right. So hopefully you got something out of that. Um, be able to think about search and um, solve some of those common problems that we see, like you know HTML in the content or searching localized. It's very easy to do now. Thanks, guys.